Um, Rossi, later on, I'm going to go through all the virtues, and then I'll say, this is the one, one of the ones Rossi talked about. Okay, so I think we'll get to you on the recording, because it is really important, because the students are going to listen to this, and they need to hear you, so, oh my goodness. Okay, Louise, so go ahead. Um, yeah, um, the virtues is not only important to creating yourself. It's not only the, for the benefit of a person, but when we put in the context of community, it's also teach us how to care beyond the benefit of ourselves. We have to care the benefit of citizenship for the sake of living well with others and for the benefit of creating a better community where um, people can develop and uh, create a better work. So, I think this is what I take from the Resi presentation. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Poppy, can you, do you have some, can you talk? Do you have a comment? Okay, well, Poppy, you can interrupt anytime if you get, if you have something to say or if your electricity works or whatever. So, okay, May, what have you got? Okay. Well, I think um, I feel a bit related uh, when Rashi talked about the practical wisdom and the thing that in Cambodia, if people gather and um, the government know it, they will be put into jail. Um, actually, in Vietnam, we also have some of the policies, some of the rules during the lockdown. Um, of course, like as far as I know, there, there is no rule about putting people into jail, but they are certainly like um, they, so they certainly have to pay an amount of money if they don't wear masks in the, when they go out. And also if um, they gather uh, with a lot of people, kind of like that. Um, however, I think that in terms of fighting against the um, COVID situation in Vietnam, the situation is kind of good. Like we used to have some of the um, point where COVID was a real matter. People need to be in quarantine, but because um the, the government was like always tracing the the person like every single person who were like infected with covid so and also um asking very clearly who they expose themselves to in every like in every day so um the situation is very good like i even couldn't imagine like how they can do it with every single person but basically we are they are doing very like a very good job in terms of like fighting against COVID situation. Yeah, so actually it's my comment. And yeah, um, I will share later about my idea because actually I also wrote about how to apply Aristotle's value, but in another aspect. So yeah, that's one of my comment about Rashi's um, talk. Okay, um, Al, are you still driving? Or can you talk? I'm, I'm around the corner from my house, but I can talk. Uh, if I had one question, it would probably be, uh, if you could pick one of the, the dialogues or readings or, or books that we read over the course of the semester to uh, that everyone in your country would read, what reading do you think uh, would be most valuable for everyone to, to read? Oh, that's actually a good question. Honestly, I didn't even think of that. But I feel like um, they should, um, the citizens of Cambodia should be reading the different articles that we read about the goddesses because I feel like it's really important, especially for women, to realize the power of um, women, like of sisterhood and womanship. Because to me, it's where we are able to work together to get out of this patriarchal world and support one another. And since Cambodia has this culture of competition, it's like an Asian thing. Um, I know I'm stereotyping, but it's true. We have this idea of always wanting to be the best, like better than anyone else. And we don't want to share our struggles with anyone or talk with anyone a lot of the times we keep things to ourselves and it can like sometimes we can reach a breaking point and burst out and so i feel like if they are able to
to read the different articles of the goddesses, especially the conversation at the end where um, there's like a group conversation where they're able to discuss um, what's, what's the problem with this goddess and what's the problem with that goddess. It's going to be helpful for them and they will learn to express their ideas and talk to other people so that we can all build from one another and be supportive of one another. Good. What about, Rossi, what about the gods where the therapist talks about these people have midlife crises, right? And how much harm they do. Like they think they're being a good man, right? Zeus and Apollo. And actually they're doing a lot of harm. And in midlife, their families often get alienated from them. Right? Do you think do you think you know young men in their 30s and 40s could learn would learn if they read some of that and maybe change? I think if they read it, they will kind of like pause and think about it, but it's going to be harder for them to change as they have this pride in themselves that they never want to listen or to change themselves and so it would be harder like honestly I've seen a lot of men here they would choose to die or commit suicide or do something when they have their midlife crisis or when something goes wrong in their life they choose not to listen nor change what they are like doing they would be like that's kind of like losing their pride or losing their face. And it's a toxic mentality that is passed down over generations. And I feel, honestly, I don't know how that is going to change when they're not willing to like open up and like think in a, a different way. Okay, is suicide very common among men? in Cambodia? It's not very common, but it it happens quite, I, I don't know how to say this. It's like, um, I don't know in terms of like, I don't know the statistics, but like I, I have seen it like quite, quite fre frequently at, at least where I live. Like it's something like happening that for example, if they can't support their family or if they become jobless, they will end up either running away from the family and they just disappeared. So people assume they like commit suicide or they run away or they were just took pills or yeah. Okay. All right. So actually, that was a good question, Alan. And for the rest of you, you can think anything with the goddesses or the gods. What about rethinking the Olympics, the origin of it, what sports, you know, is supposed to be like? Um, I don't know if Delphi. And then it was, um, we didn't do a lot with Homer. Um, I think instead of Homer, we did the gods because a lot of the Iliad and the Odyssey are about men and men's problems. So that's what we did instead. Um, and then there was Hecuba. And then there was um, Plato, Plato's dialogues. So then the question would be, if Cambodians could not necessarily read mythology, uh, Al, you should turn off your mic until you know, I mean, you can talk if you want. Okay. <laughs> um, so with Plato's Apology, I mean, they don't necessarily have to read it, but if someone explained it to them and they talked, you know, about the character of Socrates and they talk about intellectual honesty, uh, everything, the only thing I know is that I don't know. Do you think Cambodians would understand that? Or do you think that would just be lost on them? <laughs> what do you think, Rossi? I feel like it would be more lost since 
they don't have this um habit of reading and analyzing and stuff so when they started reading about it they will feel like it's a heavy piece of writing that they won't understand and even if i were to sit there and explain to them they will be like what in the world are you talking about because <laughs> they're never used to this type of writing before um usually um here 90 percent of the writings are either business related or love related <laughs> love, love and death and tragedy that's it even songs and stuff and so that's where and that's like the kind of environment that that we are raised in and so once we started reading that it will be like a whole nother world for them to dig right. into right so by tragedy you just mean bad luck right death yeah. and yeah death. You don't, technically you don't mean tragedy right where people have all these good reasons no no, no, no not not <laughs> like the, the it really just means bad luck um, and there really is a difference. Uh, but anyway, so very good, Rossi. We have to we have to clap for Rossi. Yay. <laughs> All right. So May, if you also did that same topic, then you should probably go next, okay? Okay. Um, actually, I have been a bit sick recently, so I haven't made uh, much progress, but I already have the idea and the outline. Why don't you talk um, a little slower? Just talk slower. Uh, okay. So um, I just said before that I have been a bit sick recently, so I haven't made uh, much progress, but I already have the idea um, and the outline about my final essay is like how to apply Aristotle's value into um, education in Vietnam because like I care about education and I want to be an educator in the future. So um, basically, I think um, the first virtue, we, um, the first thing we should educate like students um, is the goal should be um, to should be for their own happiness, like not for not to follow blindly any role model. Because in Vietnam, the thing is, um, students were told to like learn and. Um, go to the test and do everything to get high score, to get a good job, to um, get a high degree um, with some certain, like following some certain examples of some people. It might be like um, a famous person or it might be like some students who used to be learned in um, some, some certain high schools, kind of like that. So I think that so when I was um, studying in high school in Vietnam, I felt that um, I was like constantly being told to follow like different models without knowing who they are. And like because just the pictures told me to do so. And I was never taught to like um, to question like what I really wanted to do, what made me happy or um, what I wanted to contribute or kind of stuff. So I think that um the the question of what made people happy and how to make them happy should be brought into like um the school in every subject and also in pictures mind because like i i feel that the picture in vietnam and even the staff in school they don't really like um kind of motivate students to pursue their own happiness kind of like that um and also that that problem causes many students to fall into the depression and also some of them commit suicide at a very young age because they are not like allowed to find their own happiness but rather to follow some of the role models of success very blindly um so that's that's the one thing i think it should be applied and the second thing is um to teach students like um to understand the benefit of um doing for the community not just for themselves like doing things for community not just for themselves because i feel that um students in vietnam especially i was before just like taught to um 
kind of like do everything for ourselves. Like it was like self-driven like motivation. But like even even I was learning in a very good high school before, but um, we were never encouraged to do, for example, extracurricular activities or like to initiate any social project for other people. Even when I saw that in many countries, students in high school could do that and like uh, were encouraged to do that. Um, in high school, I was just told to like learn knowledge, uh, memorize them and then pass the examination and then um, get like a lot of academic achievement. But I, I even don't, didn't know like why I needed to do that. I, I even didn't have the real interest in the subjects I learned, but because parents and also school expected me to do so. So I was like, um, just doing it for myself. And also they told me that if I, I, I got like high academic achievement, I, can, I could get respect from other people. Um, and if I, I don't have that, no one will respect me kind of like that. So I think that is kind of a, um, a toxic like um, opinion and it like just like forced uh, students to do everything for themselves, to gain respect for themselves, everything for themselves, not uh, for any other people. Um, and they also didn't question the meaning of what they do in life. So I think it's also a problem. And one more thing, I think um, in terms of democracy and also um, political freedom, I think people, um, I mean, students in school, even in high school or in university, um, should be educated on like ethical reasoning and also about uh, political matters. Um, they sh because like actually we don't have that subject in school and in in actually in university in university some of my friends were ta are taught um, political but they were just um, exposing to um, Marxism and some of the um, and communism kind of like that they. Some of them even don't know there uh, there are the existence of like many other political theories in the world, and many countries follow that. Um, let alone the benefit or like the disadvantages of those theories. So I feel that because they um, they were not taught on that, or even when they were are taught on that, there there are a certain limit in the theories and also the perspectives they expose themselves to. So they usually um, don't know how to assess the situation in the country and also outside. Um, even when the government um, is in the corruption situation, or even there were there are some unfair, like um, some unfair, for example, unfair process in, um, for example, voting or like um, just some of the matters they even don't know. They either follow the government blindly or. Um, they refuse to post their opinion on that matter. Um, so I think that those subjects should be given um, into the school curriculum and people should oppose them, should, should have the opportunity to expose themselves to different theories and the diversity of politics kind of stuff. So uh, basically that's my current idea. I think I will also um, connect more virtues into the application of um, education later on, but currently that's my idea. Okay, so who wants to ask May a question? Well, let's see. Um, Okay, so May, when it was um, political, right? Political education, um, you could, I mean, one way to prevent, the, the issue is how do you get students to reflect on politics without either blind obedience and the teacher is unpatriotic or else just sort of blind rebellion and the government is always corrupt, right? <laughs> it's just, it amazes me how easily people fall into these stereotypes that there's almost no way 
that the government is always right or always wrong, <laughs> right? That's just sort of mm -hmm. obvious. But how do you get people to make distinctions, right? Just ask people to, um, and so that would, the question is how would you do that as a teacher, right? So you would present capitalism, you would present, you know, what it was like at this time or that time. You can present the different forms that it takes. Like, um, it was so funny when I was in China, they have, you know, opened up to capitalism, right? It's called the opening up. And it was really funny because they called it uh, socialism with a Chinese character. <laughs> which really just means capitalism, okay? Well, on the other hand, in America, you know, we get Obamacare, but you can't call it socialism. So you call it capitalism with an American character. <laughs> just, and so instead of just having all this crazy rhetoric, you should just say, here's the government and here's the economic system. And if all you have is government, you're gonna kill the economy. And if all you have is an, a free economy, you're gonna kill people because the rich will get richer. So every country in the world, except maybe North Korea, is just figuring out how to balance this, right? And then, yes. yeah, and then some common, what really needs to be in common? Well. There has, the government has to rule for the benefit of the ruled, no matter if it's a monarchy, an aristocracy, or a democracy. And also, if in one country they might need, um, I mean, every country to me needs basic health care, basic everything that people absolutely have to need. It's not a choice should be government because otherwise greed really runs it, right? Does that make sense? So yes, yes, yes. basic health care, basic transportation, basic education, the government needs to do it because if you get a profit off of something where your consumer can't say no, right? They have to take it, you're gonna sell them a lousy product at a high price, right? So that seems, you know, sort of obvious. But um, no matter what the government is, there needs to be rule for the sake of the ruled, and there needs to be trust, right, between the people and the government. They have to show that they're trustworthy, and they have to have goodwill for the people, right? And people have to trust each other. The people have to be trustworthy and they have to have goodwill for each other. So, so you know, it's not like the government can't do the whole thing. And then they yes. have to be transparent. And this is true at a personal level too, right? Transparent. Like you don't secretly hide behind, you know, do things behind people's backs. You just, here's what I did and accountability here's why i did it and then somebody else can question you and that's how you learn but just that constant dialogue that if you don't have that you're going to end up with abuses of power right and authoritarianism if you do have it you're going to have you know people arguing a lot, and some instability, but it's better to have some instability <laughs> and just keeping people honest and accountable. Even if things are difficult and you wish it could be simpler, just all those things, if you could just learn to live with those things. Um, but the thing that really bothers me is when people say, well, I don't like politics. You know, I don't, I don't like to think about it. Well, you know, that's like saying, uh, well, I just happen to like sugar and I just happen to eat it all day. You know, it's just one of those things. Like, this is not just a personal opinion. 
Like if you say, I don't think about politics, that's like saying, um, I, I don't eat healthy food, right? And because it's food for your soul, right? Deliberating about political things is like nourishment for your soul. You can't really be a person unless you get a regular diet <laughs> of thinking about complex, difficult political things. Um, and personal things. Um, I don't know, I talk a lot, but does that make sense? Uh, yeah, also, can I share something? Like, actually, like, during what you said, I usually, like, have some of the talk I want to share. Like, firstly, I want to share my personal experience in AUW, there, there is a class, um, also um, starting in, in this semester, which is ethical reasoning in um, international politics and uh, international relation and politics. I think that it really helps me. Um, you know, like before I before coming to AUW, I was actually not interested in politics. <clears throat> actually, it's it's not just because I didn't have interest, but I think that it's because politics is something taboo in Vietnam. We were not taught on that, so how could I know if I have talent in that or if I really like that? But when I come to a UW, and I think it's a very good like liberal arts like um, education environment. So in that class, um, it's the first time I was introduced to different like um, political theories and ideologies from realism, liberalism to Marxism or like postmodernism, basically a lot. And also the picture besides the lecture, <coughs> he kind of like. Um, Held some debates um, for us to like put ourselves in different positions. Even when I, even when sometimes I was put into the positions I was not like agreeing with. But basically, it helps me to like um, improve my critical thinking, to broaden my perspective, and to understand why some people think in a different way. So. Um, we were given different scenarios in debate and we need to defend ourselves. And by doing so, I could like improve uh, like my knowledge and also broaden my perspective a lot. And also from that, I, I could learn how to kind of respect people's opinions and differences because they have like, um, they come from different cultures and they have different points of view, kind of like that. And uh, thanks to that class, I gradually have interest in like uh, political education. And I know that um, I'm lucky to have that opportunity, but I know that many people in Vietnam and also I think in many Asian countries, they don't have that kind of opportunity. So I think that in the future, I may um, try to bring the liberal arts education into my country. Um, actually, currently there, there is one um, liberal arts um, college in my country, which was established um, based on the um, kind of the diplomacy between US and Vietnam, I think so, is Fulbright University in yes. Vietnam. Okay. Yeah. So I think that, um, and there, there are a lot of friends I have, they are also students in that university, and I could see that they, they already like, improved a lot and compared them to other students in public uh, universities in Vietnam, I could see like um, the clear difference. Like they have critical thinking, they could um, analyze the situation in every aspect in a, in a uh, critical way. And I think that is a really like huge step toward the um, educational revolution in Vietnam. So I think that maybe in the future, there should be more models like that in Vietnam. And also more pictures should be educated on the new method and also how to help students to kind of expose themselves to different things and also different learning methods. Um, because, because actually pictures in public universities in Vietnam, I think many of them even don't know like what debates are or like what discussion in class are. Like they just like um, give knowledge and then for students to memorize it and then to come to examination. So I think it's also um, the issues of like educating picture and then educating student, kind of like that. So I don't know if you understand what I mean, but basically that's what I want to share um, during what you, uh, when you said, when you read comment. 
Okay, Louis, do you have a comment for me? Because uh, what we talk about education, I also talk in my idea about our essay. So I think I will talk uh, when, if I turn. Okay, okay. Rossi, do you have a question for me? Actually, I don't, but I just want to comment that it's really good that May wants to bring um, liberal arts education into her country because I, I think that that is crucial because it broadens students' perspective into um, different skills that better prepares them to be um, kind and compassionate citizens of the world. Okay, good. Um, what about you, Al? Are you on? Are you available? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I do have uh, one question. Uh, what's the uh, What's the biggest way your perspective on how involved people should be in politics and like the individual's role in politics? How has that changed um, throughout the class for you? So are you asking my, about my personal like experience like in my class like how how was like individual roles like um, shaped in my class or what like can you clarify? Hello. Yeah. yeah she just wanted you to clarify. Hello. Can, can, can you can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you, but I think you can't hear us. Hello. Hi. Okay. Um, uh, I was at, basically asking, uh, how, what do you think the individual's role, how has that changed, um, in your opinion, like from beginning to end of the class in politics? Uh, so you're asking about my personal experience, right? Like, yeah. like about the class. I, uh, okay. Um, actually I, so individual roles, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you mean, but like, I think that it's not actually changing about the role, it's just changing about, about students' perspective. Like, um, actually during the whole course, we are given like um, the chance to speak like freely about politics and also um, are encouraged to talk about like, um, even unconventional like conversation that I might not feel comfortable about talking in real life because in my country politics is a taboo topic however like i am always encouraged to talk about that and in every debate we always have like the chance to speak up like from the presenter to the one who like um challenge other people in another round kind of like that i think that um the biggest trend is the student's perspective actually um last week we have a we had a final session on what we learned and what we um, get, what, what we think is the most important thing we gain from the class. And I could listen to everyone's opinion. And I saw that many of us also, like from the beginning, they may, they may not like feel comfortable talking about politics and they don't like, they didn't have enough knowledge or like um, kind of skills to talk about that. But at the end of the class, they know that um, politics is very important and it affects like every aspect of our life and also um, we can we can we can like kind of um, know many theories and also like know many scenarios in the world politics to really like pose our opinion based on that and I think that is a very huge step like from knowing nothing to knowing a lot of things but also we um, we also learn how to be like patient during teamwork and also how to be critical in every situation and to learn from multiple perspectives during the class. And I think it's one of the most important things. And also um, one last thing is like, before that we were afraid to ask questions about politics and stuff, but the, the professor really encouraged us to like pose any questions. And he said that like no question is stupid and kind of stuff so i i am like totally like comfortable like asking questions now and i think it's also a big step um so yeah that's my answer i don't know if it already like corresponds well to the question or not but that's my answer so 
Um, who is the teacher? Um, he is a Turkish professor. Like his name is Adros. I don't know if I'm not sure if you know him because he just um started teaching since. Does he have January. round glasses? Does he? Have yeah, yeah, round... yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what did you about before? Yeah, I know him. He's in the core with me, and and he meets with with me, you know, during these core meetings, and um, I was I talk a lot, <laughs> but um. He really was liking some of the stuff I said at the last meeting. And one of the things I said was that um, uh, I just trust the students because I think liberal arts is based on trust. And so I just assume the absences are excused or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but he just thought that was great. You know, yeah, trust, that's what it's about. So that was nice. Um, yeah, I've never met him. I just see him in this meeting, but he seems like a very like-minded person, you know, that I would like to talk to him. Um, the other point I wanted to make, make, I think this is an important distinction, is that just being an informed citizen, right? So making your political leaders accountable or talking to other people about the decisions being made. That's what matters. Like nobody has to change their job and get, you know, have a political career. So there's a difference between having a political career and being an informed citizen. So you could be a doctor and be totally uninformed or totally corrupt, or you could be an informed citizen and a doctor. Uh, does that make sense, May? Yeah, I totally understand. I agree. And because um, that's what the society needs. It needs people to develop some professionalism, to get really good at some skill, and to use it for the benefit of the people who need it so that they also can recognize if a politician is really using his power or her power for the benefit, because they know, you know, I could be corrupt, but I'm not, I choose not to, but that politician is because I know what he's doing, or he's not because I know what he's not doing, right? Yes. Is, that's what really is important, just informed citizens and citizens that govern themselves. Because even if you had a good politician, if the people are ungovernable, right? If they're just greedy or they're just uh, self-indulgent, there's nothing a good politician can even do. So it's very much a dynamic relationship, like an extended family. You know, People can choose to get along or not, you know? They can choose to, to, to tell stories and gossip about each other. They can use, they can choose to get along. Um, so, okay, that was one distinction I wanted to make. Um, in the US, we have a, a large number of people who have decided to have a political career um, working in the campaigns of a certain political party. And, and when those people don't have any other career options or when uh, if they're paid in a political career by the party operatives, they get paid way more money or they have way more power than they would have if they tried to get a job. That's really very dangerous because then they will uh, participate in manipulation and they will go along with the corruption They'll just say, well, I, you know, it was my career to be uh, support Republican politicians or Democratic politicians, and this is my only job, or I mean, I have a certain standard of living. And so, um, so that's why we don't really need more people who are political operatives, right? We just need people who are good people and they're informed. 
right? There's some good people, but they're not informed. Well, that's not good. You could be a good person, a good mother, maybe a good teacher, but not a good citizen. So we also need to be people who are good citizens. Does that make sense, May? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, okay. Um, Rossi, did you, uh, okay, so I think it's, I think I'll go with Louis next and then Al after that. Does that sound good, guys? And Poppy, if she can, if she find, you know, finds her voice. Um, so go ahead, Louis. Yeah, I think uh, one of my ideas of the paper is how this class and other class at UW helped me to create a soul also changing my point of view about the world. So um, I don't know if you remember a, a quote that formed the excitement shift, the book that you told me that you read, you already read before. Um, what was it called? What? Yeah? What Can was you repeat the, again? What was the book? Uh, ex, excitement shift about a liberal art college an American. Um, How do you so, spell yeah, that? Whatever. Excellent ship. Excellent ship. Mm. You, you want to type it in the chat? Okay. Oh, well, you can just keep going, Louis. It's okay. Um, yeah, the quote is, uh, the, the main reason to read the classic author to see if they may know you better than you know yourself. Oh. So I think it's perfectly true to this class. Um, when I read Goddesses, the moment we went through oh. Hestia, I just uh, almost just, I just yelled like, oh, that's me. I found myself in Hestia. So I found my I found myself for the first time when I were 19 years old on a on a book about ancient Greeks. Uh, so when I read the side four, when I read the four tasks, I can also put my experience into four tasks. Uh, even in broader term, we know more about like our community when we read Delphi and Olympics. So I think it's a fantastic experience of art in general and philosophy in specific in our class. Um, like when we read about the people of culture far from thousand years ago, we, we still somehow find myself among them. So and it's not only give us the pattern of experience, but also teach us to question the pattern. For example, like to me, I usually ask what is the dark side of Hestia? So how this dark side limit her potential and relationship with order and what, what Hestia can do like to strengthen the woman community and like order if like Persephone has the archetype, what we should do to empower her to flour flourish to a full potential instead of res restricted her. So I think like this glad turned up to like our thing about how we should act and which life we want to live. Um, so at Resi, uh, as Resi I did before, so we, we not only think about the benefit of ourselves, but we think about the benefit of whole community, or the benefit of citizen, uh, how to live well with order. And then I rely that our thought and our pattern also come from the past, even the structure and law of our society today. So we can only understand ourselves when we know about the past. And from that, we can we can really get how our world really like operate. So um, that's why I think philosophy combined with history, it really matter for fully development of a person. Um, like, what um is not it not only uh true for this class but other class like when i wrote uh i already wrote uh on one of my posts before like my i majored in biology when i was in high school 
So I spent three years to learn a lot of biological technique, technologies. And the thing that uh, recently struck me most is I spent three years to memorize every detail about, like for, for example, artificial fertilization, but I never go beyond the technology itself. Uh, for example, the recently in the social analysis class, Professor gave a, a documentary about this technologies, and they, the human, they even have an idea to use them to make money. So more than no need to carry the tools in ninth month anymore. So it could be become a service in future. I think it's a crazy idea. So the thing in Vietnam, we separate academic knowledge from society from the context of ethics and morality. So it's really hard for a student bear only academic academic knowledge itself to the world, and we hope we hope them to make it better. It's really hard. So if I never got a chance to think about the tech the technique in the humanity term, like the like in the social analysis class teach me. So it's really hard for us to resist the dark side of technologies bring to us, like make money from that. So. That's why I think um, philosophy and also liberal art college itself is very benefit for students. Yeah, this is my, one of my ideas, yeah. Good, okay. Um, May, do you have a question or a comment for Louis? Actually, I feel that what we said is actually also what I feel. I think that because we share the same life educational background before in Vietnam. And also now we are currently in AJW. And also one fact that all of the classes in this semester uh, Lee is in is also my class, even the social analysis class, like Lee just mentioned. So I totally understand the feeling. Like before that, like um, when I was in just studying in Vietnam, like every subject was learned like, um, kind of not in the relation with others. Like we, we just learn every subject separately. And I even don't know the connection between them. But here in um, in AGW, I, I, I know that um, in every subject we learn, it, it always like have the connection with other subjects, other matters. And also if we have the well-rounded knowledge in every, um, in every aspect, we can like kind of link it together and act with morality, with ethics and with virtues. Um, like like we said before in the class um, about technology and the use of that in sovereignty and making money kind of, kind of like that. I was also very surprised and I like, you know, like it, it came as a shock to me, like about like how they, they kind of made money based um, on the, on the human's body, on woman's body, and um, kind of it, it kind of, basically I it came to um, it, I, I have a lot of realization after that class, and also I want to share about one class in that or that social analysis class as well uh, before the class we said um, is the class about motherhood, and um, basically the professor gave us like a video like about ten minutes. Um, Basically, it's um, about 10, I think 10 minutes, like in each minute, we watch a advertisement, you know, it's a combination of like famous advertisements on social media about mother. So um, they are kind of very touching, like advertisements, like praising women and also mothers, but um, based on but based on the lesson the professor told us that actually those advertisements um, on the dark side, like they kind of like, um, kind of they, how to say that basically they made, um, they make the image of motherhood become like um, ideal and also like um, make people misunderstand like motherhood because motherhood in real life um, is sometimes very tough and it's a difficult task, but what they portray in media is like the very like perfect ideal like of a mom who never feel tired or like never feel angry even when they need to carry, uh, they need to have a lot of responsibilities in and out outside the house. So I feel that, um, 
I, basically, I know that media and a lot of advertisement tools in um, in real life, they are doing it for money or like to catch people's attention, but they may not care about um, the stereotype they unintentionally shape in people's like perspective. So I think it's also one of the most important things the cost gives me and also Libra education can make me realize. So that's my comment. Actually, that's kind of a form of being in love with love. Okay, so you're in, you know how when people have kids, they're so in love with their love of their kids, they don't notice that the kid is really not developing very well. <laughs> there's that. But there's also before you have kids, right? Or um, you're idealizing, right? So you're in love with the idea of being a mother. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's so amazing how easily that can happen. So let me give you a, a heads up that um, there are a lot of Plato and Aristotle scholars who are in love with being the idea of loving wisdom, right? Or they're in love with reading Plato and they just read it and read it and write books about it, write books about it, but they never go out and ask somebody, well, what is justice, right? Not only that, I know that if I just look them in the eye and said, I don't want to know what Vlasto thinks Plato thinks or what Penner thinks Vlasto thinks Plato thinks justice is or what, you know, I don't want to know any of that scholarship. I don't want to know some quote. I want you to answer me. What do you think justice is? I swear to God, they don't think about it. Does that make sense, May? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what Socrates said. And so it's even the Plato scholars are like that. They're some of the worst, actually. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I hope that, yeah, liberal arts talks about character development. And that's why they have you in this climate where you're, that's why they have school clubs. You actually have to exercise authority. You have to have to rule and be ruled. You actually have to be accountable and transparent. And there's, you know, it's boots on the ground, but then the expectation is that you go out in the world and you keep your boots on the ground, you know? You, come, you link your mind and your body, like they're always connected. You don't separate them. Um, does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay, um, let's see. Um, who else? Somebody else have a question for um, Louis? That was why as a mother, I didn't want my kids to watch TV because I thought they start watching those sitcoms, they're not going to know the difference between fantasy and reality, right? I mean, you are what you actually do every day. That's what's registering. Um, so I actually had them was important to me that they related to each other a lot and positively. And they do like each other a lot, even though they don't live very close together. Um, but the other thing, Louis, I wanna, if nobody else, I just have to tell you this story and I let's picture it as a Greek tragedy, okay? This is how I have it pictured in my head with uh, biological technology, right? The in vitro fertilization. Um, so there are people like the scientists are sitting in their labs and they have such good intentions, right? And so you have a scene where the scientists, oh my gosh, I got this and now it can help women get over for infertility and couples can be so happy. And then there's another cynical guy, right? I'm going to make so much money off of this. Now, one of those people could be, oh, I'm so glad I get to make a good living, but I'm selling a good product and it's going to make people happy. And then there's the other more cynical one. I can really get people at a vulnerable place and really charge a lot of money because they're going to want it no matter what the cost, right? Well, then there's my daughter, okay? My daughter 
uh, her husband had a lot of genetic issues. And so they did in vitro. And she said, so this is the image of like a scene from a Greek tragedy. She said it was horrible. It was this horrible experience because it was so unnatural, right? They put this thing in your, and they suck the eggs out. And it's just like, she just thought it was horrible. And so you picture it. She goes home to her husband. She says, I can't do that again. It's just too awful. And he insists, okay? He does not care about her. He cares about getting this to work. So they get this other kind of health care and they can have three cho chances. So he makes her do it again. And he makes her do it again. And that was what woke her up. This guy doesn't care about me. And she moves out, okay? I mean, that's literally what happened. But in my mind, I think of it as a Greek tragedy with all these different players. And that if, you know, you could tell people that stuff like I just told you, but when you make a play and you're watching the play, you can, you can go, oh my God, right? People, everybody needs to think about things in a way that's a lot more complex and ambiguous. And everybody has to be humble about their, if their life is, you know, particularly good or bad, you know, what is the real impact of what they're doing on the society, right? And so that's, does that make sense to the rest of you that, that that's, once you study Greek tragedy long enough, you can start to see these scenes, you know, because you see like Louis, when you're talking about the biological technology, right? There's the people who know the biology and then there's the people who sell it, and then there's the people who use it, right? And and each of those are different players and their lives play out differently. But just to be aware of that is to really constantly examine yourself and, and do what you do in a more thoughtful way that's more likely to actually lead to flourishing. Does that make sense to you, Louis? Um, yes, it does. Okay, whenever you think, ah, I'm gonna really, I mean, this is me too, right? Oh, critical thinking is one thing to save the world. So I'm gonna go into this job and I'm gonna save the world. <laughs> you know what, I didn't save the world. Um, but, you know, I would get really frustrated and get really mad. How come people don't do this? But, you know, that, that isn't the way to go. You just have to say, what, why did you ever think the world would change and people would become thoughtful just, you know, just because you were born? <laughs> um, so I, I also thought the Vietnam War, I, this is what I thought. You guys from Cambodia and Vietnam would be interested in this. I thought that that would have taught Americans the lesson that greed you know, you should not let uh, corporations make money off of war. That war was about money, the military industrial complex. So I really thought people would become more reflective. Americans would not be in love with greed. Oh boy, look at how wrong I was. It's worse than ever. Um, so, so just that, you know, just that constant process I've been I've been through a lot of phases in terms of intellectual honesty um, and, you know, learning how to be more humble about things. So I guess it's Al's turn. What do you want to write about, Al? So uh, Louis kind of touched on one of the things that I want to talk about, and that was tying back to the, the archetypal psychology, the, the stereotypes and stuff like, or not the stereotypes, but the uh, the archetypes um and i i've noticed a lot in today where old information and old wisdom is thrown out the window because we have newer things and just because we have newer and different ways to explain 
uh, phenomena doesn't mean that the old ways uh, aren't still valid. They're, they're, they're not still still valuable because there's definitely a ton of value that you can extract from reading the Greeks, reading about the, the myths and the stories and, and these personality types that, uh, that are uh, recorded all the way at the, not at the beginning of civilization, but at the, at the infancy of civilization. And when we were first starting out and the problems that you see and the, uh, the, the, the patterns that you see in those, in those stories, they're still um, uh, present today. Uh, so it's, it's a different perspective, you know, and history sort of repeats itself and it, it kind of works in cycles where we'll forget all this old stuff because we have all this new stuff. And then it's important to keep on going back to that old stuff because it's still super, super valuable. Um, and then another big thing that I want to talk about is that I always find my stuff going back to, uh, to Aristotle and moderation. And there's definitely um, almost every week, you know, in every reading, I can see a little bit of the moderation and, and virtue ethics coming out. So I really want to touch on that and how it sort of permeates all of a. Uh, of that Greek culture, all the Greek mythology, that moderation is always uh, sort of underlying as a theme in um, uh, in the lessons. Okay, May, do you have any questions or comments for Al? Currently, no. <laughs> okay. What about you, Louise? Um, yeah, um, I am thinking. <laughs> I cannot think of any okay. question now. Yeah. I can, okay, I have a couple things, which is the difference between archetypes and stereotypes, right? Because sometimes when you talk in archetypes, people will accuse you of stereotypes, but they're really entirely different. Like stereotyping is when you think someone is good or bad just for some reason other than their who they are, their choices, their character, right? Um, so stereotypes are when people are trying to make sense of something and they do it in a very superficial way. Archetypes, right, are obviously much more profound. But the thing about archetypes that's important is there's always a dark side and a bright side. And so that I think is what helps you avoid stereotyping, right? Because what it means is you can't stereotype, you know, someone's not good because they're Hestia or bad because they're Hestia, right? They just have, you know, they have their good side that here's what they can contribute. Here's if they go too far. And so it's, um, you can avoid stereotypes and still use archetypes. So patterns are okay as long as they're not unhealthy, oversimplified. The other um, irony in studying Greek stuff is that there is a kind of hero worship of the Greeks, right? The Greeks, you know, and it's blind, right? Some people, they're good, they're great. Um, don't question the value of this. Well, what is the value of it, right? And so the irony of it is, the reason I like it is because it's always punching holes in all that blind obedience, right? But the trouble is there's so many people in that field who are exactly guilty of that, right? This blind sort of, worshiping of the Greeks, <laughs> you know, they would not want you to do that. That's the opposite of what they're trying to teach you to do. Um, do people understand that? Do you understand that, um, Louis? I mean, yes. there are Greek scholars who I think are white supremacists, okay? Because they really do think Greek culture is superior and, you know, deconstruction is rotten and, you know, all this other stuff is rotten. And that is exactly not what the whole point of that culture is, right? 
Does that make sense, Louis, where you say, you know, Delphi is important, the Olympics are important because the whole yeah. thing is about critical thinking. And so it's extremely ironic. Um, the other thing it's important for you to know, developing countries, is that Aristotle and the Greeks were very, uh, one major bludgeon used to beat down people in developing countries, you know? That was one reason Westerners could tell you that they're superior because we have practical wisdom and you don't. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, that makes sense to me. It is really important for me, right, an American, to come and tell you to fall in love with the Greeks could easily be a white supremacist, you know, uh, part of colonialism. It always has been in the past. And so I have to, the burden of proof is on me to say, you can, you can get this in a way that's not colonialism, right? But you have to be careful and there are going to definitely be people. And if you, there's probably gonna, this will happen to you. You'll say, I studied the Greeks and I really love them. And somebody will come along and say, I love them too. And then you realize, uh-uh. That's not, no. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I got it. You can, you can get what's going on in their head is sort of Western superiority so that you guys are going to, you know, conform to the West. <laughs> and that's not at all what I'm teaching you. It, it's kind of funny that you'd say that too about kind of like misinterpreting the Greeks and kind of uh, changing the original... Um, intention of the works and stuff like that because I was someone was given a presentation in another, another class where they they were talking about how the Republic was uh, was a defense of theocracy and that Plato and Socrates were advocating why we need theocracy and I was like well uh, I, I don't know about that one oh, no I mean Al it's that book four they really do believe Plato is a fascist a lot of people will read book four alone without realizing it's in the context of an entire work and just think that's the entire message. When if you read the other books, there's nuance and hints that tell you this isn't really his position. Socrates says it seven times, right? Plus it's the context of Greek tragedy. It follows the patterns, right? All the patterns in Aristotle about how these poetic works are organized. You start in the cave, you turn around, right? Book four is the cave. <laughs> it's just crazy. Uh, but, uh, but you will run into that. I guarantee you there are a lot of people who think Plato's a fascist and an authoritarian, um, tried to set up an authoritarian society. It was his ideal society in Republic book four. And so if you say to somebody, oh, I really like Plato, make sure you say, no, not Republic Book Four. <laughs> um, it is unbelievable. You know, so you've read Socrates' Apology. Socrates would be killed, the first one to get killed in the Republic Book Four. There's so much irony to it and people are so blind. It's just unbelievable. Um, but I'm just warning you of that, um, so not to get too confused, and um, just say <laughs> the, the, all of Plato's dialogues are titled ironically. So in the Apology, Socrates is not really apologizing for his way of life. He's defending it. It's the best way of life. It's not something to apologize for. So all of his all of his dialogues are, you know, the reverse of what they appear, just like Greek tragedy, right? Hecuba, you know, she is the tragic character. You're not advocating what she did by entitling it Hecuba. You're saying you really shouldn't have done that, Hecuba. You knew better. So the Republic is ironic. This is not a Republic. Um, this is a right-wing authoritarian society, but
But the thing is, Athens was not a republic either because it was a degenerate democracy. So the city of Athens had not enough authority. It was too chaotic. And this idealized city they invent was had too much authority and it had censorship and government control of everything. But anyway, that's sort of, it's off topic, except that as long as I, I thought I would tell Louis and May and Poppy that um, you might run into this and that I'm sort of warning you <laughs> that the way I read things is different. I think it's fair, but it's different. Um, so I have 10 minutes and I did, I think I promised you I'd let you go to fill out the evaluations, but let me just, sorry, let me just go through this for a second. Um, uh, let's see, go through what I, what I handed you the other day. Um, okay, so here we are. Um, so that letter to students about the COVID and um, the way I put it there was that I referred to the goddesses, right? So that's one take on it. Get your Artemis in gear. You can also look at it as a historical letter, right? There's a context because at that point it was pretty scary. The students were they were on campus, but they all had, knew they had to get off campus. They had to find a way to get back home. But on the other hand, it still is true a year and a half later that, okay, we're still getting our Artemis in gear. We're still getting our Athena. And now we have all these other things to talk about, like um, Rossi was talking about with her government and how it's communicating. So. This is from the goddess's point of view. And then we had um, the coronavirus from the, uh, let's see, from Aristotle's virtues, right? Point of view, Aristotle's virtues and coronavirus. Um, so another thing, yeah, we could, um, talk about all the virtues. So Rossi talked about um, courage, generosity, and um, truthfulness of the government and uh, making the art of legislation. Distribution of wealth would be the distribution of the vaccines, right? So we know that developing countries and developed countries, you know, the, the gap the power struggle, the resource uh, differential is exposed during the coronavirus. Um, and then she talked about rectifying wrongs, what kind of punishments, uh, applying the laws. So what happens is that do rich kids get to break the laws and they don't get fined or go to jail, whereas the poorer people do? She didn't bring that up, but that's who gets to apply the laws are the judges you know, privileged from the privileged class. And so they they let their kids or their friends' kids off, but not, you know, the poor uh, people. Then we have, she covered the object of wish, uh, how, to do, how to talk about what the real options are and, and make the right choice and know why. And um, then you have to persuade people also. So is the government doing a good job of persuading? Well, you have to have trust and goodwill in order for people to listen to you, but then people themselves have to be trustworthy. I mean, it could be that the politician is completely right, but they can't convince people because people are corrupt. Sometimes, you know, the politician is corrupt. It just varies a lot. Um, then there's what sort of products are being made? Well, vaccines are being made, but there, you know, there's other products being made to help us deal, well, the masks, obviously. And so there's all this stuff sort of being invented. Um, let's see. Um, and then there, the other big issue is like the STEM type of education. You were talking about that kind of education where biology 
and biological technology, all that stuff, but that can get tied to any kind of character. And so that's, that's why I do like to fall back onto Aristotle's virtues. It just seems to me it explains so much of what goes on around us because it's just tied to the human condition. We have these capacities as the product of evolution. The universe is ordered. We evolved by responding to that universe. And the more we could remember the patterns the better our survival rate was because we were more fit, right? We could predict which places uh, are dangerous, which places are safe. So over time we developed, our brains developed, but it, ha it wouldn't have worked unless the world actually is ordered out there. So we did have those abilities, but then when we start thinking about our thinking, all of a sudden we can detach ourselves from what we see in front of our eyes. And we can come up with all sorts of ideas about virtue and vice, justice and injustice. And they can go completely against our natural drives. Like you can starve yourself for the sake of some cause or Black Lives Matter. You could put yourself in danger. You can get yourself beaten up that's, I mean, your natural response is to run away or fight back, fight or flight, right? But you can do it just because of an idea you have about justice and how to bring about social change. So human beings are capable of incredibly noble things, but they're also capable of huge evils because they have this power of choice and what governs their choices are their ideas about good and evil. And that's why it takes a whole lifetime to constantly be examining and re-examining this because things are always changing and because there are things you, things might be the same, but you didn't know them, right? You were ignorant, then you became more knowledgeable um, or you were naive about character and all of a sudden you get some insights about what greed really means, what it means to be greedy or a political operative, how they justify going along with a corrupt leader. Well, this is my job. You know, I made a commitment to the Republican Party. It's just, they find a way to justify it. And you have to understand that. Um, so Rossi talked about magnanimity, right? The wealthy people were being generous. Uh, day to day, people who aren't wealthy can be generous. Um, even tempered, we, no one talked about that, but that's a big issue. Uh, rational ambition, um, people are getting frustrated, right? Because they can't finish school, you know, they have rational ambitions and they have to figure out how to not lose sight of those ambitions during this time when they're getting frustrated, but they have to keep, you know, keep your eye on the mark, keep thinking about the highest good for you and your society. Um, make sure to honor people who are actually helping. Um, and so we we have a whole different uh, subclass of who to honor, like the frontline workers. All of a sudden, we've got frontline workers and we honor them. That just is, we. they've always been there and they've always been honorable, but all of a sudden, you know, it comes to the fore it becomes a major issue. Um, one of the reasons that I would not want to take risks, I told people, you know, I don't want to take a risk and then get in the hospital and have to look the nurse and the doc, the nurse in the face and saying, I'm putting your life at risk and your family's life because I didn't bother to wear a mask. You know, and I had that in my mind, like, I do not want to have to look somebody in the eye like that. And that was a big motivator for me, um, the frontline worker thing. Um, then there's humor. There are, there are comedians, uh, friendships. Hopefully people have bound together a lot because they have their priorities in straight and sociability. So these things are being tested, right? 
especially when on top of it is Black Lives Matter and class and also climate issues. So all this stuff is sort of, it was always there. It's just getting magnified. It's getting more intense. Um, and so these are all should be considered um, character. They're all, uh, they're building your character, right? If you can overcome the fear or, or you know, still not get depressed, right? Keep going. And it is a character builder, no question. <laughs> um, so here's the mission of Asia University. And it's a great, right? It's a great mission. Um, motivated, effective, service-oriented citizens promote development of intercultural understanding, uh, a residential learning community. Um, different cultural and religious backgrounds can grow personally and intellectually, student focused. So it is, you know, teaching is important. That's why I told you to take the evaluation seriously. And also humanities, natural and social science is a broad base of inquiry. Um, independent studies, depth, uh, applied studies, um, and then link the theory to the contemporary issues and challenges, right? Uh, intellectual, reflective, leadership, and service. So I think, you know, that really covers it. And I, I think of my classes as just giving the natural foundation for that and also the cultural foundation, the, the particular one that I studied, that originally small liberal arts schools were, uh, Plato started the first one. And so I, I do have this, I did happen to study the culture where what's thought of as the first small liberal arts school is, is the curriculum that I teach. So, um, and then Lion has its mission statement intellectual honesty, commitment to truth, fairness, patience with complexity. So um, you can write you know, your paper on that if you want to too, but it's all up to you. Um, I gotta let you go now. So um, make sure to fill out your evaluations. Uh, you can meet me about your papers. And uh, for the students who end up listening to this on YouTube, uh, don't forget to meet with me and I hope it helped probably did help to listen to this. So take care, guys. OK? Thank you, Professor. And take yes. care. Okay. I hope to see you again on campus or maybe in a class. That would be great. Yeah, OK.